Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Buckner and I use she, her pronouns and I'm an assistant professor of higher education in the higher ed program at Boise, the Ontario Institute for Studies and Education at the University of Toronto. I'm very thankful and excited to be part of the scholarly community and I recognize the work that Sharon in particular has done and has put into envisioning and facilitating the Critical Internationalization mm -hmm. Studies Network and for making sure that this month's virtual meetings continue to go forward in ways that are inclusive and accommodating. And so I am recording this presentation and this conversation starter really from Toronto which for thousands of years has been the traditional homeland of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And of course, today is still home and meeting place to many indigenous people from throughout Turtle Island. And I grew up in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia as the descendant of European settlers to the US. And as a recent immigrant to Canada, I know that I have much to learn. And I'm thankful for the opportunities and the privileges that I have to live and work and learn on this land. I volunteer today to speak about internationalization in the Middle East, or at least the region that we now call the Middle East and North Africa, as part of the panel regional perspectives. But there are a number of points that I want to unpack and reflect on before really diving into this topic, including my own positionality as a white American citizen who studies this topic. And so moving forward, I want to really first think about this question of what does it mean to be an American who lives, studies, research, learns in and from the region that we now call the Middle East or the Middle East and North Africa. And I chose this picture intentionally as an example of what it means, which is that I follow this long line of Orientalists who have a history of exotifying and othering the region. And I have a citizenship that gives me very privileged access to elite spaces in the region, despite my government's history of resource extraction and political interference, war, violence, invasion, and willful ignorance. And so in this way, I speak very much as a position of an outsider, a privileged outsider, who is nonetheless given undue legitimacy and authority to speak on behalf of the region and on this topic. And I recognize that's a very problematic, problematic dynamic. But at the same time, I also have lived and studied and conducted research and travel throughout the region for over 15 years. I have studied Arabic and have long-standing close personal relationships and connections with people throughout the Middle East region. And I have recently finished a manuscript for a book on the way that the Middle East is portrayed in higher education development discourses. And, and so I'm drawing on some of that work and particularly a chapter I wrote on internationalization for that book in my talk today. And so on that note, I wanna address what it means to be someone who has experience while having sort of undue authority. And so the first question that I want to address is this idea of region. I'm speaking on a panel called regional perspectives, essentially. And that even that term is highly problematic when we talk about the Middle East and North Africa. It's very problematic. So on one hand, there are vigorous debates over this question of to what extent can we even treat the Middle East as a cohesive singular region in the world regions. The many countries that make up the Middle East and North Africa are different places. And the extent to which we conceptualize them as this sort of cohesive region or the 
to the extent they're receiving essentially like cohesive treatment as a single world region is a product of the Cold War and the US government and other governments sort of dividing up the map into in ways that were legible to them. And it's a very modern construct. And so if we look back in history, we know that the ancient world was very different in how it sort of saw the world. Civilizations around the Mediterranean constantly interacted with one another. And so the divide between Europe and North Africa, for example, uh, there wasn't the same divide that we see today when we look at the region. So Tunisia, Lebanon, Egypt, Greece, and Rome were all very much part of the same region and very similar and part of trade networks and the same sphere of interaction than were, for example, Iraq. So Iraq and Tunisia, today we put them in the same region, whereas um, that's a social construct. And, and it reflects very sort of contemporary processes and colonial processes as well. And so in that sense, I do speak about my work as being situated in the Arab Middle East and North Africa, and specifically the Arab um, world, even though, but even using that term Arab is also very problematic because the, um, the region is not all Arab, and in many parts of the region, Arabs are col colonizers, and they um, you know, oppress linguistically and culturally indigenous groups such as the Berbers or the Tamasif in North Africa and the Kurds in other parts of the region. And so we have to recognize that even like specifying the Arab Middle East is problematic. And, um, and so, you know, then there are other debates of what counts, who gets to be included, and we often exclude Israel, for example, or Turkey and Iran because they're not Arab, um, or Mauritania, for example. So it's a it's a complicated question of to what extent this is even a region. But and it's also one that has tremendous diversity in it. And so that's why, especially when we talk about internationalization, the countries also have varying levels of economic resources and national wealth and different demographics and different religions. And so in that way, it is uh, problematic, you know, as we know, to really even create this binary that this is in versus this is out. And so one thing that I want to talk about, though, is that in many ways we do, especially in higher education development, which is the field that I come from, think of the Middle East as a singular region and treat it such, I mean, at least the major donors and very powerful organizations um, who are implicated in internationalization processes treat the Middle East and North Africa as a region. And this is primarily because Arabic is the majority language in most um, of the region and Islam is the majority religion in most of the region. But even we have to recognize that there are 14 different recognized religious sects in Lebanon, including the Jews, and of course there are various like ethno-linguistic minority groups. And so I say all of this just to say that when I talk about the region, know that I recognize the tremendous diversity. And then I want to talk about one other piece before jumping in, which is that it's not only fraught to be an American who studies the Middle East, but it's also fraught to be an American who knows and cares deeply about the region and the people and societies in the region, because particularly in North America, where I'm situated and much of my work is um, oriented, the Middle East as a region of the world comes with significant baggage is one word that I can use to describe it. It's constantly, consistently misrepresented in media. It's very misunderstood. A lot of that diversity that I just talked about is completely ignored. And it's consistently subject to really offensive stereotypes. And so I put this quote up here as, why do we need to go there when we can just pick up a newspaper? Is an actual quote that one of my colleagues at the University of Toronto asked me. And 
the reason that I study the region, though, in many cases, my work is directed at other um, North Americans who have very wrong perceptions of the Middle East. And so I've often found that when I speak about my research or my work or my life experiences, my audience has stereotypes. They have implicit assumptions, they have biases, and the stereotypes include Iraq, the Iraq War, terrorism, and 9-11, the um, ISIS, it, Islam, and of course, um, the sort of ongoing conversation around Israel and Palestine and the colonization of Palestinian lands. And there are discourses and assumptions that there is something like uniquely stubborn about Arab authoritarianism that makes it um, that Islam is incompatible with democracy or it's incompatible with secular rationality. And all of these discourses are used to sort of explain the failure of the Middle East to democratize, to develop, and um, it's very common in higher education development to then also use these discourses to explain sort of the failure of higher education systems in the re region at producing knowledge, for example. And so I put this quote here explicitly to really uh, explain that when I address this topic, I struggle with not only my own position, but also my audience's lack of understanding and lack of work. And, and so in some cases, like a lot of my work is countering very superficial stereotypes. So if you say you study the Middle East as a white American female, one of the first questions I get is, do I have to veil when I do my work? And it's, um, it's offensive and problematic that these are sort of our starting points in some ways. And so I, and yet it, they're not poorly intentioned necessarily. It just comes from a lack of understanding. And so I put all of this uh, up front to uh, qualify both my own position, my perspectives, but also to provide some of the important context in which I'm going to be addressing this question of what does internationalization look like in the region? And what can our understanding of how internationalization of higher education in the Middle East and North Africa and the Arab region in particular, where I do my work, contribute to our you know, critical internationalization studies network or, or to the field of critical internationalization studies. And so despite the problems that I mentioned with my, um, with my positionality, I have, I mentioned, I think recently written a book uh, and the manuscripts done on higher education and development discourses in the Middle East and North Africa. And so one of the key themes and arguments that I make in that book and that I write about is that internationalization of higher education is occurring within the backdrop of what I would call offensive development discourses that consistently position and portray the Middle East and North Africa as a region, as um, sort of continually and perpetually failing and the higher education systems are seen as lacking in quality and failing their societies and so I have put just a few of the thousands of quotes or newspaper articles that you can always find that use global rankings to sort of show how the region is failing on many levels um, and it's a you know Harris Gutierrez has called it a the crisis rhetoric and so we see this consistently that it's always um, portrayed as failing and that this is often linked to discourses of youth unemployment and disenfranchisement and then ultimately back to the security concerns of for example the US and Europe and concerns over um, terrorism and so it's important to 
put this context up front because it's very different than, for example, North America, where internationalization is often mapped onto discourses of diversity or immigration pipelines or these ideas of mutual understanding or benign global citizenship. In the Middle East and North Africa, that isn't the pre prevalent, most um, prevalent discourse. And instead, what internationalization it projects in the region that both at the institution and the national level are being used to really signal modernity to a world that has in almost invariably characterized them as backwards and lacking modernity. And so they're being um, used really in, and so as political projects, as, as everywhere, but the mapping is slightly different. And so in my book, for example, I really try to counter the, the depoliticization of these higher education development discourses that are, um, as sort of Sharon talks about within the case of internationalization, in the same way, development is framed as like completely neutral and a positive thing. And in this work, I really draw on Edward Said, who is the great Arab intellectual and the author of Orientalism. And he, for example, stated when he was thinking of writing about Islam that the hardest thing to do to get most academic experts on Islam to admit is that what they say and do as scholars is set in a profoundly and in some ways offensively political context. And he wrote that in 1981. And I think um, that here we are, you know, 40 years later, and the same is true about higher education development and internationalization. And I know that that's something that we all think about as scholars associated with the, this network. And so what I want to really think about now is to frame this conversation by just recognizing that many people may not know what internationalization looks like in the region, for example, other than um, things that we've heard about the branch campuses, for example, in Abu Dhabi. And so um, my overarching point here is simply that internationalization in the Middle East looks very similar. It looks and it's practiced in ways that are very similar to other world regions. And so, um, you know, one, there are the international students. And so you can see I have in my book, I sort of go through some of these ideas that the number of international students, and this is the international students as a percentage of the total student body is going up in many countries in the region. Obviously it's very low in North Africa, Morocco, Tunisia, it's still very low, but in Jordan, um, it's now at 15% of the total and Qatar and the UAE, um, it's um, you know much higher, a third or a, a half of all students are now international students in these countries and so it, like other places they um, the institutions in many cases are like actively recruiting international students it's interesting to think about where those international students are coming from the national backgrounds of their students are very different than the students who for example are enrolling in um, the US or Canadian colleges and universities, for example, they're much more um, likely to be from other Arab countries or from Sub-Saharan Africa and less likely to be from Asia. Um, but then there's also another um, aspect of internationalization of higher ed that's happening in um, the region, particularly in the Arab Gulf states, are um, government funded scholarship programs. So outbound mobility or um, but that are funded by government scholarships. And so this is happening in many places, Kuwait, the UAE, Saudi Arabia, um, Qatar are just a few examples, and they all have programs that are directly funded by ministries. And what I sort of analyze and would bring your attention to in this slide really, is I look at both what you are allowed to study and um, what where you can study and in this they're quite restrictive i don't have the um programs of study here although i have studied that in my book and they almost always sort of depoliticized uh 
technical skills or sort of applied social sciences. So you can't study history, you can't study sociology, um, you can't study English, but you can study applied linguistics, for example, and you can study teaching English as a second language, but you can't get a bachelor's degree, for example, from a foreign university in English literature in these programs. And that's because they are, being tied to sort of labor market demand. And at the same time, they have often a narrow set of countries where students can study. And so Kuwait is the most restrictive and it's worth sort of pointing out, like if you get one of Kuwait's Ministry of Higher Education scholarships, the only place that you can study is a university in the United States. So you can't study in Europe or other Arab countries or Canada, for example. And this is in one way these, um, although some of the others you will notice are slightly more inclusive, um, they're almost all English speaking countries, especially the UAE and Kuwait. And there is very, um, it's sort of a replication of these sort of colonial hierarchies or that reinforces the dominance of the U.S. and English-speaking countries and sort of where these um, prestigious scholarship winners can study. And then the other thing I want to bring up, which many people I'm sure will have heard about, are the branch campuses, obviously. So there are something like 100, more than 140 branch campuses of foreign universities operating in the UAE and then in other parts of the region. Qatar has a, very many as well. And um, some of these are very well-known large-scale projects such as NYU Abu Dhabi or the Education City campuses in Doha in Qatar. But um, there are also many, many, many institutions that you may not have heard of that are operating in free trade zones in Dubai, for example. And they are well known. I would say the Middle East as a region is well known and highly associated with these branch campuses. And in many ways, um, this is conceptualized for, you know, as a way that the particularly the countries that have um, resources, especially from, you know, resource extraction from oil and um, gas are able to f sort of fast track through extensive um, investment, their um, sort of improvement in quality of their higher education systems. And so we've seen these sort of like imported campuses as a way of um, sort of rapidly upgrading the quality of education. And so I mention all of this to really talk about that you see through these patterns that the internationalization in the region really is being sort of mapped onto discourses of development and quality and modernization. And a lot of that is through sort of rankings. And so in my book chapter, I really, I also look at the why, at the individual level. And in some of the arguments I make in that are that internationalization represents sort of an opportunity and it confers status and distinction to these predominantly upper middle classes who very much seek international study opportunities and because of the way that they see it as being read in local labor markets or providing opportunities for immigration that they want. And in that way, it is very much desired and we have to recognize that. And at the same time, at the, for the nation states and the governments, internationalization is this nation state project and it really is being used to project um, modernity or to prove the sort of state capacity and secure global status very I would say in ways that are somewhat almost defensive in ways that are trying to prove modernity to a world that has like for a long time called especially the Arab Gulf states backwards and sort of um, and so there is that sort of desire to project a different vision. And yet one of the points that I make, I'm sure you guys can see that internationalization as it's currently practiced very much reinforces this, um, coloniality and the colonial reality. Uh, um, it really perpetuates as a constant belief that foreign is better. Foreign is almost always, or at least 
Western is the foreign is better. And that that's deeply problematic. And so in this next section, I just want to reflect on some of these findings from my research and what they might mean and what we might learn from or for the Critical Internationalization Studies Network. And so the first, the question that I really ask and want to reflect on is how do we disrupt this like assumed linkage between international, Western, and prestige? There's almost like a linear equation there. And so I don't have answers, but I just have thoughts and reflections on some of these um, questions. And so the first thing that I always reflect on is that the region is often portrayed as like failing and we, and, and so it is often like seeking internationalization. And for example, administrators at universities in the region have come to me and said, how can we internationalize better? How can we use internationalization to like rise up in the rankings? And so one thing that we can do, or, I, or at least a starting place where I start is to recognize that the Arab world is already deeply internationalized. It's youth are multicultural and multilingual and very cosmopolitan and very mobile. And they are everything that internationalization, you know, as the neutral discourse sort of claims that it seeks to produce. And yet we I think that especially if you are based in North America and you look at the region, it's never enough. It's never good enough. So Dubai is one of the most cosmopolitan cities in the world. It's um, like Toronto most people who live in Dubai were not born there. They come from all over the world. And yet Dubai is never held up as an equal peer in sort of the global cities in the way that uh, New York and London, Paris are. And so in this way, it's a cosmopolitan, but not enough. And often, in my conversations with people who have these views, it's often because um, Dubai is, it, because the UAE is not democratic. It's, it's authoritarian. The government is um, controlled by sheikhs. And so I think that one place where I start is to study internationalization in the Middle East means to like deeply reflect on democracy and what it means to sort of be born in a democracy where that is a, like a pres the presumption is that it is a better model for um yeah that it is a better political model and that um or at least it, when it's coupled with protecting civil liberties, for example. And so perhaps, uh, and so it's just an area where I think that recognizing the importance and sort of the the status of Dubai as a like cosmopolitan city that is home to like many internationalization projects is like a start, right? But then I want to focus on another question of the branch campus. So the UAE in particular and Qatar as well um, are well known and held up as, you know, these great examples of countries that have many branch campuses. And yet the branch campus is always dismissed and it's never good enough, right? And so the idea that it's a, the branch, even though NYU calls them like spokes of the global hub, it's always the terminology branch campus reinforces the hierarchy that there is a branch and that there is the home campus and that it can only ever be the branch. And I really strongly recommend the work of Neha Vora on um, her, and her work where she has done an ethnography of teaching and learning at Texas A&M, Texas a &M Qatar, and it's a branch campus in Doha. And she offers a very nuanced view of what daily life is like in branch campuses that is much um, 
more nuanced than is typical in the media. Because if you look at how branch campuses are portrayed in the media, it's always, you know, um, they're always subject to great to, um, scrutiny over labor rights violations and whatnot. But in her work, Nehavura describes how the anthropology students in her, like Anthropology 101, they took offense to one of the core texts that, that she had assigned that portrayed marriage between cousins as exotic. And she explains how in teaching in Doha, it helped her understand the extent to which her own discipline, anthropology, and American higher ed in particular, as an enterprise, we continue to rely on these Orientalist tropes and to center Western students' perspectives. And that she suggests that the ethnic, national, linguistic diversity and the interactions with faculty and the campus resources that are available to students in Doha are creating opportunities for learning and learning through diversity that are wholly out of reach for students on American campuses. And in some of her more recent work, she also reflects on how denouncing sort of um, internationalization projects in authoritarian regimes, such as those occurring in the UAE and Qatar and um, other places like China as well, allows Americans, American scholars, and those situated sort of in the home campus to really dismiss the rising authoritarianism that is occurring in the US and in many Western democracies too, and sort of use that as a, we can sort of criticize the Arab world for its authoritarianism as a way of sort of authoritarianism, like projecting it as a, occurring elsewhere and not here. And in fact, we know that's not the case in our own societies. We have many examples of authoritarian behavior and action. And so, yeah, I reflect on Sharon's comments and that the, that acts of like local and global justice are often seen as operating on different planes and that in fact they're like intricately related. And I think that when we, that is definitely true in the Middle East, it's easier to sort of think that authoritarianism is over there and police violence is here when in re reality they're in very connected. And so then I just want to move to my final slide. Yes, which is street art from Rabat, Morocco, where I used to live. And it's showing a woman in a traditional veil and with traditional henna on her hands. And I have, again, no answers, but I think a lot about Islam in the context of the Middle East and North Africa is the dominant religion for most of the people. And Islam is often portrayed as uniquely unfit for higher education internationalization or sort of like incompatible is a better word. It's, you know, Islam on one hand is othered, it's non-European, non-Western. Of course, that's not true at all. Um, but it's often portrayed as at odds with those sort of um, European values of and of secularism in society, for example. And then it's often in higher education discourses um, portrayed as incompatible with science and modernity, which is also not true as we know. And so then you have people who say like, oh, um, particularly conservative strands of Islam are ba like backwards looking and we are future oriented, you know? And so, in general, this like modern university that and the higher education system that is built up around it is in, I mean, has its, you know, origins, the European university is traditionally religious. And yet in today's world, we tend to think of it as a very secular institution. There's a divide between the secularism and the science in the universe, the, the science and secularism, and then faith and religion on the other hand. And it's difficult for sort of this um, this university model that we're situated in to really make a space for faith and religion. And I would say that critical spaces and scholars are implicated in this. It's often easier to talk about spirituality than um, explicitly about religion, but in the Middle East and North Africa, where many people do identify strongly with Islam and or a particular faith, then there is likely much more integration going on 
and I think that when we talk about sort of the affective dimensions of internationalization and sort of the future of the world and the fears and these types of things that societies in their region have had wholly different experiences um, with conflict and so the assumption of stability is not necessarily there and so there's actually ways that we um who are sort of situated I, i'm talking myself as an american and living in canada are situated in north america but actually have a lot to learn from societies that have um experienced great disheaval you know, upheaval and disruption in many ways, but then also have like long standing um, faith that uh, is sort of a reservoir in many ways. Uh, and I am not sure what this means for internationalization, but I do think that there is sort of work to be done there where we think about and we reflect on what aspects of internationalization sort of are, are compatible or incompatible um, with, you know, what aspects of others are incompatible with our own views, for example, on what internationalization is or should be or what critical spaces even and critical reflections can or should be. I don't really have any answers on that. I just think that there are a lot of um, ways in which the experiences of those in the Middle East can actually challenge a lot of what we take for granted and what we see as problems. And so I think that those conversations need to continue to happen and I don't have um, answers to those questions. So I will stop there. And I really look forward to continuing these conversations and thank you all. I am going to stop.